Welcome Zion Church to this Good Friday service, this solemn but hopeful service that reminds us that even on this darkest day, God is with us. It is solemn because we gather here to remember the brutal crucifixion and death of our Lord so many years ago, but hopeful because through this commemoration, we remember the entire story. We know the benefit of knowing the purpose and ultimately serve behind Christ's sacrifice and death, which the disciples and friends of Christ at that time did not know or understand. And yet, despite that, they believed. This day, so many years ago, those who were closest to Jesus must have felt as if the world had ended. All hope seemed to have vanished. Luckily, we know that the opposite happened. Instead of hope vanishing, hope was truly being born anew. This hope is with us always, even today, on this solemn day, as we remember. In order for hope to be offered us today, in the 21st century, even in the midst of a global pandemic. So in lieu of our traditional tenebrae service or our weekly um, service format, we have something new and exciting planned for you. A new way for us to hear and experience the greatest story ever told, to have it come to life before your very eyes. Hopefully offering and even challenging, challenging you to hear and experience the story in a whole new way through the lens of this powerful story, through the eyes of those who were trying to make sense of it all as they experienced it firsthand, as they witnessed their Savior and their friend enduring such horrific torture and pain, violence and cruelty, and then dying such a horrible death, being mocked and persecuted and condemned just for loving them and you and me. At any moment, Jesus could have said the word and God would have swept him away from enduring this atrocity, would have saved him from it. But their love for the world was so strong that Jesus was willing to choose to go through with that faith, to save the world, to save us, and to offer hope to all of humankind, even to those who in this story condemn him, spit upon him, even pierce his side, broke his legs, whip him, kick him, and nailed him on that old rugged cross. For us, 2,000 years later, this story sometimes can feel like just a story. We have heard it so many times before, year after year, but it was real. It happened, and it was painful and rich, and it changed lives for generations and generations of Christians, and it changes lives today. And how much more for those who live and love for this man who they knew as Jesus. So come and experience the story of the one that we follow. Just as we have found that there are gifts in the wilderness, these people perhaps also found their place in the world, their true calling, as a result of that walk in the wilderness that we call life. And today we will encounter four such people who had front row seats in this incredible drama. First, we will meet Judas, a disciple of Jesus, then a Roman soldier, then Mary, Jesus' own mother, and Salome, 
a friend of Jesus. So let us allow these ancient people to call us more deeply into our own faith story. But let us prepare our hearts first for worship. The first person that we encounter along our journey to the cross is Judas, the disciple who betrayed Jesus. Let us ponder what may have been going through Judas's mind to lead him to betray his Lord and friend. Jesus was troubled in spirit that night, and he said, I'm telling you, one of you is going to betray me. The disciples looked at each other, not sure who or what he was talking about. Peter leaned over to Jesus and said, Lord, who is it? Jesus turned to Judas and gave him his own piece of bread. Go quickly, Jesus said to him. Do what you are going to do. I was upset. He wouldn't fight. There were so many followers by now, and they were all in Jerusalem. And, and what is this? Blessed are the meek. What was this? I was thinking this was going to be a revolution, and we would finally deal with those Roman occupiers. He had such charisma and power. This, couldn't he do something? This son of God? My frustration finally took over. I had been bottling it up, and when it came to the surface, I just snapped. If we weren't having a revolution, I wanted out. I was tired of holding the purse for this motley group of people. They were giving the money away as fast as it came in. Perhaps I could get some money from those despicable Romans. Anyhow, then it happened. I was approached. They had seen and were watching me. Perhaps they noticed my indecisiveness or my frustration with the group. A plan was set in motion. Then, there I was at the table, his table, knowing full well the plans that were about to present themselves. I noticed the air, it was heavy 
and thick. I was anxious and full of remorse for what I was about to do. Being at this table reminded me of all the meals we had shared in our years together. Sometimes it was just us, this band, small band of disciples, but often it included someone that Jesus had invited to the dinner as well. He would invite anyone to the table, people that we just couldn't believe that he was hanging out with. It was hard to understand These were people that took advantage of others and had no interest in supporting him. They were always questioning him and were quite frankly beneath him. You know, bottom feeders. Bottom feeders. I realized as he stretched out the cup of wine to me and and dipped the bread in it, that he saw right through me. He knew my thoughts. Once again, he had invited a scoundrel to dinner. This time, it was me. He was offering to share the cup and break bread with me. He never would have hurt anyone. He loved us all even the lowest of the low. Next, we encounter the Roman centurion, the commander of the century or the tactical military unit that would have been tasked with Christ's crucifixion. Let us now consider how the crucifixion may have affected this centurion or one of the centuries that he commanded. After dinner, they went to the Garden of Gethsemane And Jesus prayed. And then the soldiers came and they arrested Jesus. They took him to the council and to the governor's palace, where they tried to make it look like it was a trial, but it wasn't. And then finally they led him away to the place where criminals were hung, always on crosses, so that they would die slowly, painfully, Jesus was hung between two other crosses, bandits on each side of him. And the sign over Jesus' cross said, This was the King of the Jews. The scene was horrifying. 
Not that I was used to crucifixions. They were the favored way of putting prisoners to death by the Romans. And so I'd assisted many times. But I'd heard about this man, Jesus. We thought Barabbas was going to be on this cross, but the crowds had become almost out of control. And I'd heard that Pilate simply washed his hands of it, sent this one to die just to shut them up. Who knows what these crowds really were screaming about? There was so much confusion and rumor, no one will probably ever know the truth, is what I think. But when the reality hit his followers that Jesus was really going to die and they saw him heading to Golgotha with the cross, the horror really began. Even the heavens seemed to be wailing as storms began to appear. It gave me a chill, I'm going to tell you. These are not things I want to tell you. I am a soldier, but it is always easier protecting others than protecting yourself. From the mothers who beg for mercy for their sons, from those who insist on waiting the hours and even days it takes to die this agonizing death. Being a soldier can't always protect you from what you witness firsthand. Like hearing Jesus talk to the prisoners on the other two crosses next to him. The promise that death is not the end for them. And then he looked at me, right at me. And he spoke the words I'll hear for the rest of my life and the words that mean I can no longer do this job anymore. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Later, after he died, they pierced him in his side. I still don't understand why, but in that moment, I knew he was truly the Son of God. His blood poured out just like the love he poured out for his people. The blood flowed from his side. The blood flowed. The love flowed. Mother of Jesus is next on our journey as we imagine the overwhelming grief and sorrow that she must have felt as the crucifixion scene unfolded before her very eyes, helplessly watching her very son humiliated, beaten, pierced, mocked, and then nailed upon a tree to die. Her flesh and blood, her baby, and she was unable to intervene to help him, to save him as he was in the midst of it all, unknowingly to her, saving her and the entire world. Standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and some other women he had known well. When he saw his mother and the disciple John there in front of him, Jesus said, Take this son in my place. Take good care of my mother. My son, from the moment the angel said to me, You will bear a son, my life was no longer my own. And yet it was every bit mine, moments treasured, remembered in my heart alone. Every moment he grew within me, every day of his youth, every movement of his ministry, 
from that day in Cana to this very minute. At times, the pain of watching him give his life away seemed harder to bear than the wonder of this unimaginable life God had given me. And especially now. In this moment, I am not just the mother of Jesus, shedding tears for my son. I am the tears of any mother who has seen their child die before them. I am the tears of every mother who has lost children in war and injustice. I am the tears of all loved ones who cannot save their loved ones as they starve or are taken away by illness or injury or are swept away by a tsunami or a flood. I know the tears of mothers whose children lose their lives to addiction or are consumed by depression or who are lost in violence. And I am the tears of all those who do not know the fate of the missing ones. I am the tears. Finally, we come across Salome, a follower and friend of Jesus, as she tries to make sense of his death by comforting the other women and planning to help them anoint his body for burial. The Hebrew tradition of anointing honorees with a sweet-smelling oil made of, <clears throat> of a combination of many herbs was used at the con consecration of kings and also as anointing for burial. Early Christians incorporated use of this same sweet-smelling oil as part of their baptismal and confirmation rites to emphasize their new identity with Christ, which also means anointed one. Mark's Gospel mentions our last character at the scene of the cross. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. Salome later accompanies the women to the tomb. I was there at the cross, just as I had been there for the last several months, one of his many followers. But I was not just a follower. I was a companion to Mary, friend of Jesus, and the other Mary, mother of Jesus. And at this moment, they truly, truly needed a friend so many of the followers had fled as soon as the guards had come to the garden that night. But I could not leave. I would stay with my sisters, my friends, at the cross and through the agonizing depth of the Sabbath keeping stillness until it was time to anoint and prepare his body for burial. Tending to his body will help me comfort. 
in the darkness, there in the tomb with memory of him, even in his lifeless body. I will let my movements carry me into a future I am not sure I can face. But for now, this act of love and kindness to my friend, preparing his body for burial will have to suffice. Now I must go to prepare and anoint my Savior's body. We have journeyed to the cross where Jesus died a horrible death, experiencing through eyes other than our own from the people who were there. 
So let us now take a moment to soak it all in, reflecting on that dark day, the day when all hope seemed to have been lost, knowing today that it was only the beginning of true hope that would be reborn, a hope that was yet to be born on Easter morning. But for now, we need to let the darkness sit. We need to own it and reflect with those who were there in the bleakness and the despair of the day and in this moment, in the silence, before joining together in that beautiful prayer that our Savior so lovingly taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to contemplate and meditate and pray over the course of the next several hours as we move closer to the celebration of resurrection morning. Until then, let us always remember the sacrifice that our Savior made for each of us so that we are able to access and connect to our God. So that we may love one another as unselfish, unselfishly as Christ has loved us. So that we may cling to the hope that Christ made available to us always, even during times of despair and darkness. So as we prepare to close, I would like to remind you that for the remaining time of Holy Week, there are resources that will be made available to you tomorrow on Holy Saturday to help aid you during your time of contemplation. There will be a short Holy Saturday video reflection made available. It will be informal and shared on our Facebook page and emailed out to those on our email distribution list. Also, Hark's Station of the Cross experience will be available to you in the same way. This annual event, which went virtual this year in place of the in-person event is, that is usually held at the city park, and hopefully we'll be able to gather at the park next year. If you haven't been able to do so already, please take advantage of our Monday Thursday service. It remains available to you at your convenience on Zion's YouTube channel. So now, as you prepare to go forth, remember, you have a place in this world, a place where everything comes together in your body and you disappear into a seamless whole. Get over whatever shortcomings afflict you and inhabit this world with your fullest self. May the spirit of the living God made known to us most fully within the wilderness of life. Go before you to show you the way. Go above you to watch over you. Go behind you to push you into the places you may not necessarily go yourself. Go beneath you to uphold and uplift you. Go beside you to be your strong and constant companion. And dwell within you to remind you that you are surely not alone. That you are loved. Loved beyond your wildest imagination. 
And may the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you and around you now and always. Amen.